Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! First one is titled, How I Got Even With A Crap Former Coworker That Wanted To Spread Rumors. I'm going to be honest. There are no saints in this story. There is no good guy or bad guy. I felt I was wronged and I got revenge. That said let me give y'all some backstory and get to the good shit we're all here for. I worked as a security guard for a few years at a factory. My last year I had made site supervisor and ran the guard booth. We were contractors. Our contract was simple. Make sure everyone who comes in is logged, watch the cameras, call bigwigs to pick up their visitors. Every now and then we did a walkthrough or some paperwork. Simple. And it leaves you with a lot of relative downtime depending on your shift. During my tenure I made a few friends, a few enemies and got along with most of the people working there. It's surprisingly easy to investigate incidents when people like talking with you. One of the enemies I made was a supervisor, let's call him Ted. Ted had worked his way up from a line worker and felt that since he had made his way from nothing, he deserved his ego. He had squared himself firmly against anyone he couldn't control and I never gave him his due. We all know his type. Now Ted treated his line workers pretty poorly. And more than a few came to me to report his misconduct. One of our duties was to log any of these complaints as an incident report, submit a copy to the factory admin, submit a copy to our company, and then file the original. Ted had his own folder in that drawer. Ted did not like this. Ted did not like me. At the start of COVID, we lost most of our staff in the booth. We were down to three guards trying to cover a 24-7 schedule. We did a lot of 12-hour shifts starting from March going all the way to October when I left. My company struggled to fill the missing spots, hiring two guards during that period. Neither lasted more than two weeks. October came, I was burnt. Then both my remaining guards quit. I don't blame them in the least. I immediately turned in my two weeks and refused to work more than 12 hours a day. After I turned in my notice my company scrambled to replace me and the missing guards. They got my replacement at the start of my last week and she started on a Sunday. I trained her for one day and she never came back. I discovered on my last day she had claimed that I intimidated her and made her uncomfortable. She told my boss she didn't feel safe around me. Now I was livid at this. I have never mixed business and pleasure. I'm a big guy, I work out. I have never had those intentions at work. It was a major joke anywhere I've worked because my tagline has always been, I don't shit where I eat. I was burned out. I had an amazing woman I am now dating who was coming out to see me in two weeks. I had spent hours training this woman. I had her scheduled during my shift for the entire week so I could walk her through everything to do with the job. I had squared off with the factory admin to keep it that way. I was doing everything I could to help her because she was coming into a major ducking mess. Admin was looking for a different contractor. Supervisors were trying to access our files. We had shit tons of sensitive information that would have let anybody move up the ladder quick. Or at the least remove a lot of competition. It was chaos. At this point, I hadn't had a day off or a good night's sleep in three months. And the boss I had only ever talked to over the phone had arrived in person to tell me this crap. I had almost been terminated over this on my last ducking week. If I didn't have the work ethic my father taught me I would have walked then and there. I finished my day and walked away never intending to think of that job again. Now the story should end here. But it didn't and this is the juicy part y'all are hankering for. See after I left a few friends kept me up to date on the going ons. My replacement came back for a day and then quit, citing the long hours would keep her away from her kid. I was salty, but it's not my problem. Until a few days ago. See Ted had found out about her allegations and began spreading rumors I had been terminated for sexual harassment. He then told people that I was a serial harasser and had caused a former female employee to quit as well. 
she had left as I had gotten the site supervisor job over her. I had seniority and she had a dirty disciplinary record. She had a few incidents that had nearly gotten her fired. I didn't like this. Especially given that two-thirds of the incident reports I had on Ted were for sexual harassment. What Ted didn't know is that I don't like being ducked with. While I'm quiet and unassuming I had plenty of time to build my mutually destruction folders. Little personal history, when I was a computer tech I had been royally screwed over and nearly fired by my then boss. He gave me directives that were a violation of company policy, bad enough that when they came to light I was given an immediate final written warning. Since I had no proof he told me to do what I did I shouldered full blame. Since that day I have created mutually assured destruction folders, M, A, D, folders, on anyone that I felt would try to duck me. Ted was one such person. All the originals of my folders are kept hidden in online storage and most are never touched. But Ted upset me and was threatening my future job prospects. Reputation is everything. So I opened his folder. I had access to the camera system at the factory. Folks, small town factories are disgusting. People do crap you wouldn't believe. One really popular thing to do is have sex in the parking lot. Ted had built a little harem for himself by giving better line positions to women that gave him a little action. And I had pictures and video. I made a nice little folder with some choice clips and stills. Then I sent them to his wife and oldest daughter. Dude is 20-ish years married with four daughters, two in college, one graduating, and one graduating in a year or two. No clue what happened there but I doubt it's going well for him. And that wasn't the end. I wasn't satisfied. This never would have been a thing if that replacement hadn't used me as an excuse to duck and run. I told Yal there's no saints here. During her one day of training my replacement had asked me about cell phones with good cameras and a bunch of weird policy questions. A few careful questions and lo and behold she has an OnlyFans. I warned her that was a huge violation of our contract with the company, any type of sex work is forbidden as the company has clients in Vegas and some European countries where that is legal and doesn't want any workers moonlighting. The company is incredibly strict on that. Strict to the point I could have terminated her on the spot. They are impartial. Man or woman, it is not tolerated. Thinking on this and being very irate, I track it down and she was nice enough to have links to her premium snap. I bundle this and send it to three groups. My previous employer, the IRS, and her ex. She had been in a protracted custody battle with him and our state is a little conservative. Judges here do not look favorably on sex workers. Most have a prejudice that the women are hooked on drugs and will harm the child. And I just gave her ex evidence of sex work and possibly tax fraud. If his lawyer can't get at least split custody, no child support, that on the ex for being a piece of crap. So that's my story. Let me know if y'all feel this is pro-revenge or not because honestly I'm not sure if I went far enough. Next one is titled, Jerk Co-Worker's Car Turns Into a Giant Snow Globe. Northern United States. Snow on the ground. The dead of winter. The co-worker at the local shop is a consistent jerk. Said co-worker also goes out for frequent smoke breaks and, rather than standing in the cold outside the back door, likes to sit in their car. So one day, a different co-worker of mine comes into the shop with a cardboard box in their hands and a gigantic grin on their face. Long story short they have purchased two pounds, now think about this two pounds, of glitter. It came in several small clear plastic bags all within the cardboard box they were carrying. I'm sure I'm just remembering it this way, but I swear at one point somebody said, I have a plan. Said co-worker with the gigantic grin manages to slip outside into the parking lot during the shift. They come back with an empty box. Fast forward to lunchtime. Said jerk co-worker goes out to their car for a smoke. It hasn't been snowing, but it's cold enough that you can see your breath. So they getting in their car and as the door closes, the engine comes to life. At my other co-workers insistence, several of us have gathered by the break room window to observe this occasion. What happened next I can only describe as a literally screaming snow globe. 
The howling that came out of that car, as all of the glitters came shooting out of the dashboard air vents, were filled with surprise, panic, denial, and eventually anger. For about three seconds the front windshield of their car looked very similar to the effect of stirring metallic paint, only vertical and multicolored. Years. No exaggeration. No joking. Years later, they would come into the shop and, I am told as I no longer work there, from time to time you can see a piece of glitter stuck to their backside, or their hair, their hands, their boots, pretty much anything that would have come in contact with the interior of that car. Several of my friends still will not let said co-worker drive them anywhere, as they're afraid to get fairy glitter from the car. Next one is titled, Annoying Neighbor Gets a Payback from People She's Troubled Around the Neighborhood. Once upon a time, I was a newly married lad. We purchased my grandparents' house from their estate, as our first home. We didn't have kids yet, so we both had full-time jobs and hectic schedules. Incident number one, one day, I came home from work to find my dog out on her run, going crazy. She rarely barked, so I paused for a second, trying to find out what was going on and watched as a bright yellow sprinkler came flying over the fence. There was a bunch of stuff lying about my backyard, where the neighbor kid, let's call him Evil Son, had been throwing it at my poor dog. I walked next door and banged on the neighbor's door. The boy's mother, let's call her witch, came to the upstairs window, not even to the door, and yelled, what are you doing on my property, at me. By the way, this is my very first interaction with this woman. I introduced myself and tried to explain what was going on. She immediately jumped to, do you have video of my son throwing stuff? Then, inexplicably, which started blaming my wife and I, if we weren't such hermits, everyone wouldn't hate us so much. Odd, all of my other neighbors waved when we went by, but we didn't interact more than that. She was the only one I didn't know. Anyhow, she went on, and it turned out that she was upset that I didn't tell her that my grandmother had passed. Yeah, I hadn't told someone I didn't know about a family matter. Fine, whatever, I dropped the matter and left. Incident number two, shortly thereafter, I stopped working a regular 9 to 5, and started my own business, working out of my home. I noticed some mail went missing. One day, I see the mail truck go by, and put on shoes to go pick it up from the mailbox. When I get down there, I find the box empty, and which walking away from it with my crap in hand. I yell at her, and she drops it in a pile on her driveway. Proceeds to yell at me that it was blowing around her driveway and that I should be more careful. Yeah, so I call the cops. They are reticent to do anything since I didn't actually see her take the mail from my mailbox, but they still go over to talk to her. I can hear her yelling at them from inside my house. The next day, she runs out and stands in front of my car, trying to confront me as I am leaving. I tell her in no uncertain terms that I am okay with running her over. Incident number three, a neighbor's pet bunny went missing from its outdoor hutch. Another neighbor spots evil sun down at the end of our cul-de-sac, looking suspicious. Bunny is found, strangled and mutilated, where evil sun was seen. Cops are called, denials, the works. Incident number four, we were getting our house ready to sell. Part of that included stripping and repainting our attached deck. I come home from work and find a can of paint has been opened and thrown across the deck, some furniture, and the side of the house. There are a few child-sized footprints through the paint. Cops come, but don't give a duck. Incident number five, evil son is expelled from his elementary school. He was found with a kill list containing most of his classmates. This was not long after Columbine and similar incidents, so folks were sensitive about stuff like that. Incident number six, which has an extinction burst, as they call it, blaming everyone for everything bad in her life. She puts flyers in everyone's mailboxes, talking about a conspiracy against her. Did you know that that's actually illegal and punishable by a fine? She does now. Incident number seven, which takes a different neighbor to a task, out in the street. Turns out, she doesn't have any friends, anymore. Other neighbors join the frackers, ganging up on her. Turns out her kid herding their rabbit, or her kid throwing rocks at their cars, and various other events, made her no friends. Incident number 8, which gets kicked out of a city alderman meeting, where she tried to have the entire neighborhood condemned for various imagined slights. Results, so, after years of dealing with this woman's antics, we prepared to move to a new house. 
We threw one last blowout party, as one does. I get a little inebriated and went on a rant about how little I was going to miss having that neighbor. A friend decided that payback was in order, so we went down into the cellar, and perused my grandfather's shelves of stuff he never threw away. Amongst it all was a bottle of killer. Great Depression era, block letters, killer. I have no idea what was in that stuff. Now, this is where the story gets a little hazy. My friend disappeared for about an hour and then was back, as if nothing ever happened. I never saw the bottle leave the shelf. But, a few days later, parts of witch's lawn started to turn brown and die. Big block letters spelled out, I am a witch. I ran into witch a week later, as I was getting my mail. Contractors were tearing up her lawn, laying down rolls of sod. She stomped over to me and ranted about my other neighbor's kids. She clearly saw them apply lighter fluid to her lawn, and light it on fire to burn the awful message into it. Funny thing, whatever was done to her lawn, within a week sections of the new sod died, and the message reappeared, although blobby and illegible. And I still have that yellow sprinkler. Next one is titled, X won't give back the tickets I bought for her before so I reissued new ones. I dated a girl a while back for a bit and we decided we wanted to go see a concert that we both would have enjoyed. The concert was about 6 months out from the date the tickets went on sale but I bought some for us anyway. I figured it would be smoothish sailing until the concert because everything was going well between the two of us anyway so I figured why not? At $100 a ticket, I think it would be a fun event to go to in the future and gave us something to look forward to. So I bought the physical tickets and when they came in I gave them to her for a birthday present, at this point the concert was only a couple of months out no biggie right? Wrong. As you may have guessed the relationship didn't work out so well, we shall say mutual differences occurred. Well, she started giving stuff back that I gifted her over time, but never gave me the concert tickets back. Thinking I was out of luck, I was about to count those off as a loss and get over it when I decided to call Ticketmaster and see what happens to tickets that are lost or stolen. As it so happens as long as you have the same credit card and an ID you used to purchase said tickets they can automatically issue you new ones. So what happens to the old ones? They become invalidated but the person won't know that unless they attempt to go to the concert with them. I think you see where this is going. Now since I was petty as hell, I called her up and explicitly asked about the tickets, hyper petty I know, but nonetheless she ignored the question did not even say something like, duck you I'm not giving those back, just simply pretended not to hear me. Well, I had already issued new tickets which had she said something to me I would have let her know that, but she didn't want to make amends about it so duck her. I brought my best friend at the time of the concert. The show was great. Fantastic even. No hate text messages, no illicit Facebook posts. Nothing. I figured she shrugged it off and didn't go, because imagine the embarrassing feeling you'd get going to a concert assuming with someone else because you had two tickets only to be told at the gate that your tickets don't work because they were flagged for being stolen. Awkward. Now I have to preface this by saying, my tickets were really inconvenient to get to the location in the arena. Meaning that people in the section we were in really had to go out of their way to get to this section, basically one concourse in or out of the nosebleed section of the arena. If you are going to meet someone chances are good the only reason you'd see them is if they deliberately came to your section. Nearing the end of the concert the band walks off and just before they came back on for their encore I kept getting this really uncomfortable feeling someone was watching me. So I look over out of the corner of my eye toward the concourse and I see a figure of a woman walking down the hallway. No way, she was there. Right? Anyway, I ignore this odd feeling because who would after being embarrassed at the entrance to the concert go and scalp, because the show was sold out, another ticket just to come up to the section you were supposed to have seats in just to see if your ex was actually using the tickets? Crazy right? Yeah I thought so too. Welp turns out she really did buy another ticket. Mind you she brought her friend to the concert to go to the concert, but because I reissued tickets they would have had to scalp two tickets, but she didn't. Next one is titled, My brother's ex had an unfortunate event when I shipped her things. My little brother and his girlfriend came to stay at my house for the weekend, and the girlfriend was super self-centered and obnoxious. When they left, she forgot her clothes and toiletries because she left them sprawled all over my bathroom. 
About a week later, she and my brother moved into an apartment together. After he paid for the moving truck, deposit, and utilities, she cheated on him with her ex and kicked him out of the apartment. This left him broke, homeless, and heartbroken. In the days after the breakup, she kept calling and emailing him several times per day, demanding that he ask me to ship her clothes and toiletries back to her, I mean, it's really important. It's my north face. My brother called and pleaded with me to ship them to her so she would stop having a reason to contact him. Being the loving sister that I am, I gathered up the really important North Face sweatshirt, shorts, underwear, shampoo, conditioner, soap, and razor. I folded everything nicely. I then wrote a nice note apologizing for taking so long to mail them to her, and let her know that I hope all is well. The note was written in permanent marker, and the paper happened to be resting on the really important North Face when I wrote it. Unfortunately, the ink bled straight through the paper and onto the shirt. Also, unfortunately, the shampoo, soap, and conditioner caps were not tightly secured on their bottles, and the contents leaked out all over the clothes, further spreading the ink. The most unfortunate result, though, was that her razor didn't have any sort of protective cap or container and left little slashes all over the front of the really important North Face. She received the package, and my brother never heard from her again. Last one is titled, Boss paged me on my wedding night so I almost ruined his marriage. Boss paged me on my wedding night, yeah, bad on me for leaving the pager on but in my defense, it automatically turned on after charging and I wanted to have a full battery before setting off on my honeymoon trip. He did it as a joke, but it came at an inappropriate moment. We had a page only if something's on fire policy, so I had to call in even though I had just gotten married and was about to go on two weeks vacation. When he answered, he laughed so hard I just had to do something about it. So when I got back I programmed the mail servers to call out on their phone lines and hit his pager with dial back numbers for phone sex services. At 4 a.m. Every day. His wife got this pager before he did one time and saw a text message something like, I loved how you described how you would duck me, Jerry. Call back when your wife's gone for the day. His wife was not amused. She thought he'd been calling phone sex operators and tore him a new one. He knew it was me, but he was too stubborn to ask me to call it off. So it kept up for weeks until he finally figured out where the script was running from and used it to page me instead. We had a back and forth pager war for a while, but then it all ducked up when an actual data center emergency happened and one of us ignored the page thinking it was the other pranking him. That ended the fun. Thanks for listening.